Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays at 9 a.m. And if you're in the neighborhood, come on by and join us at 5383 Martin Street. That's right, Martin Street in Harupa Valley. Today we are in the book of 2 Corinthians, and we will be looking at chapter 7. Chapter 7. Uh, Let's go ahead and pray. It's one of my favorite chapters. <clears throat> now, gracious Father, we humbly come before you this morning and giving you thanks for, for another day, Lord, for giving us breath and life, Lord. We do pray, Father, that you minister to us, Lord, through your word, and that, Lord, you would help us to truly, truly understand the importance of reading and studying and applying your word to our lives, Father. There is a principle, Father, that you have given to us, Lord, that if we are obedient to you, Lord, you promise that you'll take care of us and you'll bring blessings to us, Father. How important that is, Lord. So many of us live our lives without you, Lord, and we have so many struggles, Lord. So many of us live with you, Lord, but yet we don't read your word, and yet we still have struggles, Lord. How we need to read your word, Lord, and apply it to our lives. Yes. And we'll find, Lord God, that life seems to be easier with you by our side, blessing us, protecting us, leading us and guiding us, Lord, <clears throat> with strength, most of all, Father. And I believe that it's not necessarily the outward things of this world, Lord, that affect us, but it's the inside, Lord, of our hearts, the worries and the cares for this world, Lord, that destroy us more than anything else, Lord. It's our mindset and the things that we think and dwell upon every single day over and over and over again that just destroy us, Lord. And there is a peace that we can have in Jesus Christ uh, that will not destroy us because we know that we are right in the hands of God. And we just pray for that strength, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Good morning again. Good morning, Dina. Glad you could join us. <clears throat> Let's get your Bible and turn to <clears throat> Second Corinthians. It's in the New Testament, probably about center in your Bible of the old of the New Testament there. Uh, and we are looking at chapter seven. And as I said earlier, one of my favorite chapters. And the reason is is because it really lays it out very clearly how we as believers uh, should be walking with the Lord in humility and also in repentance, a life of purity uh, and holiness. Not that we're perfect, but we should be striving to be perfect as he is perfect. And this is what Peter said in his letter. So Paul is going on, and, and if you remember Friday when we last met, he ended with us as believers coming out of the world and being separate from the world and when we're separate and do not touch the unclean things, it says that the Father will receive us, we will be his sons and daughters, and he'll bless us because of it. So there is a sense of protection there. I think we need to understand that. There's a sense of protection in the arms of Jesus, just like there's a sense of protection in the arms of our mother. You know, when you were a little child, the safest place for a child to be is in the arms of their mother. A safest place for your child to be is in the protection of their parents if they are under the age there. And so the safest place for us to be as believers is really in the will of God and in a personal relationship with God. So he says, after saying all that about coming out of the world, being separate from the world, and, and let me just define that a little bit because I think we need to understand this because the church is failing right now. It really is failing, and it seems to be going down in a spiral, not for the good or the better. Oh, yeah, churches are growing, and there are mega churches out there, but they're not teaching the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation. They're doing more topical studies, and they're missing out a lot. Uh, you might learn a lot about a certain topic, but you're missing out the whole counsel of God. And the whole counsel of God is so important because um, it deals with every aspect in life. Amen. You see, what churches are doing today is they're picking and choosing the scriptures they want to teach on a Sunday morning. And they're picking and choosing the scriptures that talk about God loving you, God caring for you. And, and if you 
only hear those things, then you never understand that God also disciplines and corrects and judges us. And so we need to understand that. Now, we need to know that God just doesn't love us blanketly in, in the sense that he approves of what we're doing or how we're living. He doesn't. And there are certain things that we see happening in the church today that is very evident. And, and it's interesting. I posted uh, yesterday with Cinco de Mayo. Uh, you would think that as a Hispanic myself, I would be celebrating this uh, independence from France, <clears throat> in a sense, as we won the battle. But in America, it seems like Hispanic Americans, but not only them, Americans too, because it's, it is a holiday for uh, the Hispanic, but they take advantage of it. But they take advantage of it to sin. They take it as an opportunity to go out and drink and party and say Cinco de Mayo, you know, kind of thing, and, and have no idea what it's really about. And I had posted something about drinking. I went all the way back to the book of Proverbs and talked about how wine is a mockery and how wine will affect your, your outlook in that moment, how it affects your body, how you'll stumble around, you'll fall, things will get dizzy. I mean, it describes it perfectly there in Proverbs. Do you know how many likes I got on that? Two. Two. That says a lot about the church. Now, if I were to write something about how God's going to bless you abundantly, I would have got 50, 100, you know, likes on it. Because, of course, everyone wants to be blessed. Everybody wants to be, you know, you know uh, touched by God. But when it comes to those areas that we don't talk a lot about, like drinking in public, like drinking and showing it on Facebook and, and being okay with that, you know, we don't want to hear that stuff because that's negative in a sense. And now you're being judgmental uh, towards me. And that is far from the truth. And so Paul deals with some of these issues here. Right up front in verse uh, 1, he says, Therefore, I've asked you to come out of the world. He says, having these promises. What promises? That you're sons of the father and daughters. He says, beloved, let us. Now you notice he says us. That includes the apostle Paul. So that includes every one of us. Uh, pastors are not exempt from this. But let us, what? Cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting. That's an action, right? And I'll guarantee you, and I haven't looked it up, but it's probably in the present tense, meaning that you need to continually perfect yourself in holiness. So as believers, we should be looking at our lives every single day and ask ourselves, are we walking in holiness? Are we walking free from fleshly desires, from filthiness? So let me get down to it. <clears throat> are we watching things that are filthy? Are we listening to music that is filthy? Then we shouldn't be doing those things. We might be saying, but we have grace. We have grace under God. No, you don't. Not in those areas. God never gave us grace to do that. Grace, grace is, is favor from God to be freed from sin, not to be in bondage to sin. He has given us the grace to live without the sins of this world. And we are to be holy and we are to be cleansed from these things before God. Now, the church doesn't like that. And you wouldn't get this on a Sunday morning because they're not going to talk about this. It's too convicting. Let's, let's talk about God's love, you know. Let's talk about how we're sons and daughters of the Most High God and as sons and daughters, nothing can stand against you. You're a child of the King. You're a prince of the King. You're a princess of the King. That we like, you know, financial stability. Let's talk about that and how God wants to bless you and so forth. But talk about cleansing yourself from filthiness. That means what are you watching? Be careful what you're watching. Be careful what you're posting. Sometimes I see filthy posts by Christians who think it's funny, oh, this is so right, you know, a, a guy who sleeps with a hundred girls, you know, and they post these things on there, oh, this is so true. You need to be careful about those things and what you're posting. So he goes on, open your hearts to us. Now, Paul the Apostle, of course, is dealing with those in the church of the Corinthians that were accusing him of things, and they weren't receiving him. So in a sense, he is defending himself, but yet, not in the sense where he feels like he needs to, but more in the fact of giving the facts of what God has done through the Apostle Paul. He says, open your hearts to us. So that is Paul, probably uh, Timothy and Titus and Luke and some of those guys that were hanging around him. He says, we have wronged no one. 
We have corrupted no one. We have defrauded no one. Now, how is it that you do that? How is it that you can claim that you have not wronged anyone or corrupted anyone or defrauded anyone? How do you do that? The only way you can really do that is by never taking from anyone, but always giving to someone. If you're always giving, if you're always helping, if you're always supporting, then they can't come to you with, with, uh, with, <clears throat> with a sense of facts. You've done me wrong because you took. When, when have I taken? I've never taken from you. You know, I've never even asked you for anything. You know, I've only given to you. So Paul is saying here, we have always served you guys. We haven't wronged you. Uh, we haven't corrupted you. We haven't defrauded you. In other words, taken advantage of you. He says, I do not say this to condemn. And he's not saying it to condemn them or to make them feel ashamed, as we saw on Sunday. He doesn't write to do that or to convict them. He's saying, as a matter of fact, for I have said this or said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. Oh, that's a beautiful picture there, to die together and to live together. That touches my heart. I have a, I have a tat that says, we live together, we die together. Uh, when I was in South Sudan, <clears throat> uh, one of the chaplains there um, saw me and I was looking outside the compound gates and I wanted to actually go outside the compound gates, but they told me not to. And he asked me if I wanted to go. I'm like, yeah, I want to go. And so he says, come on. He put his arm around me. He says, we live together and we die together. <laughs> and I'm like, I looked at him like, okay, let's go. <laughs> you know. And so that, that has always ministered to me because we have lived together. And there's going to be a, a point in life where we can die together. Let's do it in serving the Lord. That's what's important. So he goes on in verse 4. Great is, great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. Paul loved them dearly that he could correct them and admonish them as a father did. Because he wanted the best for them. And if they were in error, he's going to correct them. He's going to make them straight. Uh, they're in error because they thought, Paul, you're taking advantage of us. Somehow you're defrauding us of something, and yet they had no evidence to it at all. I, I don't, you know, and I've been in that situation, so I know what Paul is, is saying. I've had people say, I don't like what's going on here. I don't like the way you're doing things. That's the problem with the church. And so I'll say, can you give me an example? Well, I just don't like it. And, you know, and I'm like, could you give me an example of it? Well, I just, and they, could, they can't give me an example. Either they don't remember or it wasn't significant enough that it burned a little memory in their, in their mind. And to me, it's like, that's childish. That is childish. That's emotional. That's immaturity right there. Uh, you're not going to like a lot of things in the church. That doesn't matter. The, the point that matters is that we love one another and work through the things that <clears throat> we are doing in the church. I am exceedingly joyful in all of your tribulation. Verse 5, for indeed... When we came to Mesodania, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. This was Paul's life. You know, we came to you because of your trials. We came to comfort you, to help you as much as we can, and yet we have conflicts outside of the church from all all points, and Jews, and Gnostics, and Gentiles, and even Inside, we fear that our lives can be taken at any moment. Uh, there's a certain amount of fear when you're on the front line serving the Lord. Uh, there's just that element that can take you at any moment. And Paul's saying, we had that fear too in our lives because at any moment we could be taken. There was one point where Paul was literally stoned and some suggest that he actually died. So, you know, you, you, you go through that once and you wonder, am I going to go through that again? Because it could happen when a crowd gets together and they start screaming and yelling at you. And Paul's thinking, oh, okay, here we go again. You know, maybe they're going to pick up stones and, and stone me. So there's a sense of fear there. Nevertheless, he says in verse 6, God who comforts the downcast comforts us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation. And consolation just means comfort uh, with which he was comforted in you, when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice even more. So he was comforted by his brethren. One of, one of the men that worked with him was Titus, a young man. Uh, 
he wrote to him a little letter called Titus and to encourage him as a young pastor. And Titus in this point encouraged him with good news that there were some in the Corinthian church that were looking forward to seeing Paul, that wanted to be comforted by Paul, and that encouraged Paul. It's always encouraging when, when brothers and sisters receive you and not necessarily reject Amen. you. And there's enough rejection, and you, know, you don't need any more rejection from your, your brothers and sisters at all. But Paul said, he's comforted us uh, because of your zeal. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it. Now, at this point, Paul wrote a letter. Some suggest that it is Corinthians here. Some suggest that, that <clears throat> there was another letter. <clears throat> Could be 3rd Corinthians, who knows. Could be actually 2nd Corinthians, and this is 3rd Corinthians. We just really don't know. We don't know where that letter is. But he wrote them a letter, and it was a letter of correction. And he said very clearly here, uh, I made you sorrowful or sorry with my letter, and he doesn't regret it. Now, again, <clears throat> his heart was not just to make them sorry or to shame them. It was to hopefully get them to think and to bring it before the Lord and then consider whether these things are true or not and then repent from them so that they're right with the Lord so that God can bless them. That was Paul's heart. Uh, someone years ago had asked me, what do you do when someone uh, tells you something about yourself, you know, and says, I have this complaint against you, or says, you know, you do this, blah, 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 blah. I, I said, well, you always have to consider it. You always say, thank you so much. I know it doesn't always happen that way, but you listen, and then you consider it. You say, am I like that? Is there something in me like that? And, and I need the Lord work on that. Now, it might be a, a, an area where, where you really have no way of, of changing it. It's just, it's going to take time uh, on your side in prayer and the Holy Spirit to change. You know, the Bible never tells us that we change each other. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that I'm going to change you. Paul is, you know, saying, hey, I wrote you a letter uh, correcting you, but he has no power to change them. That has to be the Holy Spirit. You know, a pastor leads, but he has no power to make people follow him. He can't convince them to follow him. They have to follow him by their own choice as they're praying to God and feel that God has called them here to this church or any church, and I'm going to follow that guy. They have to make that choice, but you can't force them to follow you. Uh, evidence of that is that not everyone follows you. <laughs> you know, They say, no, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to go somewhere else and follow a different, different person. So Paul couldn't change them, but he could correct them. He could bring to light the situation and then leave it in their hands to change. He goes on about this uh, sorrowful letter. Though I did regret it, for I perceived that the same epistle uh, made you sorry, uh, though only for a while. He says, I did regret it, and yet I didn't regret it, because I don't want to hurt you, but I understand that there needs to be change, and it seemed like it changed you for a little bit, but then you just went back to doing the same things. So then he defines what true change is. <clears throat> says, now I rejoice, verse 9, that you, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance to salvation, not to regret it but the sorrow of the world produces death. So there's two types of sorry. And a greatest example of that is Judas Iscariot and Peter. Judas Iscariot was worldly sorrow. He betrayed innocent blood. And he was sorry for doing that, but he didn't regret it unto repentance where he turned back to God. He actually went and hung himself. That was to death. The Bible even says that Satan entered into Judas. And so Judas actually, when he died, went to hell, separated from God for eternity. Where Peter's sorrow was that he denied the Lord Jesus Christ. He acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah. And he acknowledged that he had failed him. And he was in true repentance, wanting to turn back to the Lord. And that's why the Lord went to him in John chapter 21 and says, Peter... You know, feed my sheep. And Peter's like, oh, Lord, you know, 
I've already denied you once and now you're asking me to feed your sheep. He says, I, I, can, I can love them as much as I can only love them, Lord. I'm just a man. And you see that repentance there too in his heart of humility. So he had learned his lesson. So there's two types of repentance and there's, there's that type. I don't really take sorries too seriously when people say that. I'm just, I'm just sharing you my, with you my heart right now because people do things and they go, oh, I'm sorry. It doesn't mean anything to me. What means something to me is when it changes. That means something. Because then they'll go do it again and you go, hey, what about, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I mean, tears will come too and they cry because they're emotional and they think that's going to um, somehow um, make their sorry, their words more weighty. When the fact is what makes it weighty, like we saw on Sunday, right, is not the words, but it's behind the words, the power of it, right? Yeah, words are nothing, Paul said. It's the power behind it. I'm going to you Corinthians because I don't care about your words. I want to see the power behind it. And so if you say, I'm sorry, then there should be repentance. Repentance means that you're going to turn from living that way or you're going to turn from that situation and do better. That's true repentance. Uh, worldly sorrow is just, oh, I got busted. I'm sorry, I got busted. You know, uh, uh, hopefully you don't catch me next time. You know, type of attitude. But they're not really repentive. repentive. I use this quite often with, with people. Um, in counseling with them about what true repentance is, you know, it's like I told them I'm sorry, you know, but then the other person says, but they keep doing it. So they're really not sorry. You know, they may have an issue in, in that area, then they need prayer, they need strength, they need to somehow figure out what we need to do to, to help me so that I can change in that area. But unless there's true repentance, it's not godly sorrow. He goes on for for observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things, you proved yourself to be clear of this matter. You see how he defines godly sorrow? He says, you went out of your way to make sure I could see your repentance. I mean, you were, you were diligent to produce what I wanted to see. Uh, you definitely cleared yourselves of these issues. You were even angry that you couldn't change in those areas, so they really tried. You know, Judas should have went and weeped and said, Lord, I wanna believe in you so much. I wanna give my life to you. I'm sorry, I'm gonna repent, and I'm gonna serve you. <laughs> I'm gonna serve you, I'm gonna keep trying. But he didn't do that. Peter did. He went away sorrowful. He went back to his business, but as soon as Jesus came by, he says, Lord, help me, you know, help me, Lord. So a big difference there. Therefore, verse 12, although I write to you, I do not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that your care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. And so he's writing to the Corinthian church there, not necessarily to the men that, that were um, causing the whole situation, you know, the ones that were causing the disturbance or the ones that were wronged. But he's hoping that not everybody is going to be a casualty. Therefore, we have been com comforted in your comfort, and we rejoice exceedingly more for the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For if in anything I have boasted to him about you, I am not ashamed. But as we spoke all things to you in truth, even so our boasting to Titus was found true. And this and his afflictions are greater for you as he remembers the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. Therefore I rejoice that I have confidence in you in everything. And so there were those that were truly repenting, and Titus was the witness uh, to that repentance. So, amen. <clears throat> you know, true repentance in salvation is this, is that we acknowledge that Jesus Christ came as God in the flesh, that he is God Almighty. There is only one God and no other gods besides him. And that he died at the hands of men. He suffered upon a cross, a crucifixion. His giving, giving his life 
so that we could have eternal life. But he resurrected on the third day, and we believe that Jesus is alive today, and he's sitting in heaven at the right hand of the Father. We can receive that. We must receive that. Ephesians 2.8 says very clearly, for by grace you have been saved. In other words, it's by favor. God has already appropriated. He's already done the work through his son Jesus Christ. It's there. So the favor is there. It's in your account. For by grace you have been saved, but it's through faith. It's through faith. It's through faith that you're saved. So everything's been prepared for you. Everything is set at the table for you to eat. All you have to do is chew it. Receive it by faith. And faith means is that you cling to, you hang on to, you actually begin to change in your thinking, in your way. You become a new creature. That's the word born again. You become a born again believer. And the old things pass away. So now, like Paul said, now you cleanse yourself from all filthiness. You walk in purity. Your life is no longer a life walking in the world, but you separate yourself from this world. That's the Christian walk. And sadly to say, we need to pray for the church because the church is not doing that today. It's not. It is allowing homosexuality to go into the church. And we're going to see more and more of that. It is allowing sin to enter into the church by people who are dating and living together before marriage. Uh, it is allowing drinking from the pulpit. <laughs> How sad. From the pulpit. You know, all the way down, they're drinking before the congregation, before the people on Facebook. Uh, and I just talking to a brother today that he said that he used to take church people from here in California and he would take them on a charter bus to Las Vegas. And I started laughing. I go, what a picture that is. You know, here they are, church people, and they're going to Las Vegas. He goes, yeah, kind of con contrast, isn't it? And isn't Vegas known as Sin City? I'm like, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, these are the things that the church has to consider um, and look at. Uh, we should be sticking out to the world, and we should be light, we should be salt, and not like the world. Something to, to pray about and something to challenge us. Thank you for viewing our Devo 30. Please share this on your Facebook wall. You never know who will be ministered by it. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word. Every word in the Bible is so true, Lord, and we need to live by every word, not just pick and choose from the books here and there, Lord, that suit us, that we like, that are itching our ears in a sense because uh, they're not making us feel bad. They're not condemning us. Uh, they're not making us feel shameful, Lord. Um, but Lord, every word from Genesis to Revelation should be taught in every church in our country, Father. We need to get back to biblical principles, Father. Uh, not to uh, Christian worldview, because that's distorted in itself, Lord, but to a biblical worldview. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say, Lord? We thank you, Lord, that you have left us a book that's still here, that we can still get into and truly find out what God says about every issue in life, Lord. Um, let us not be numb or cauterized Father, to these things, Lord, as the church seems to be, Lord. They're not dealing with them anymore, Lord. They're brushing them under the rug so they don't have to think about them. Uh, they're not bringing them to light in the pulpits so that we don't have to think about them. And we can live our life in somewhat of a peace uh, because uh, we're not being challenged in our faith. And I do pray, Lord, for the church today that you would bring it to holiness, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. God bless you. If you have any prayer requests, please post them or private message me, <coughs> and we will pray for you uh, here in the church. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.